In this video, we're going to cover the operation of the RAV 1760 car alignment system. The 1760 is a six sensor system, so your front heads will have the long boom, the rear heads will just be a small containerized unit with no boom on it. You'll have one single camera in the back, whereas your front cameras uh, or front sensors have a camera in the back and one in the front also. So you have two cameras on each front head, a single camera on the rear, three heads on one side, six, six cameras on total. The operation and navigation of the 1760 is uh, very similar to the other two aligners. Uh, you have on the screen a red, blue, gray center button, yellow, and green keys for navigation. The red button is always going to take you back a screen or stop the uh, current operation. Your yellow and blue keys are typically used in the alignment program for navigation up and down. The gray key is typically a selection key within the alignment program, and the green key is always going to advance you forward. Now you also notice that on the keyboard we also, on our F keys, have red, blue, yellow, and green. These are your primary navigation keys on the keyboard itself. Fortunately, you have four other remotes on each of the aligner systems. You have the sensor heads. And as you can see here, put it like this, you can see that they also have the red, uh, blue, gray, yellow, and green navigation, navigation keys. So you can actually navigate around the program at any sensor head in any one of the four positions just as if you were standing here at the key uh, board of the alignment uh, machine uh, doing your navigation. Now, to turn the heads on, you simply press the center gray key and you'll notice that you'll get a red indicator indicating that the head's been switched on. During the alignment program, when you exit out of the alignment program to shut the aligner down, which in this case would be your red key here, the heads will automatically shut themselves off when the alignment program closes. If you need to manually uh, turn the heads off for any reason, like you're in the middle of the alignment program, uh, the lunch bell rings or whatever, uh, you need to go, well you can manually go around and turn each sensor head off by depressing the two outside keys, the red key and the gray key. So you'll notice when I depress them both at the same time, my sensor head switches off. Another time that your sensor heads will switch off uh, automatically is if the uh, angles and numbers, uh, camera angles, don't change any within about a 12, 13, 14 minute period. So if you're uh, setting the machine up, uh, perhaps you take the initial measurements, you get a phone call, you get a call away, and you're gone for 30 minutes. Well, after about uh, 12 minutes or so, if none of the numbers change uh, between the angles on the sensor heads, then the machine will automatically switch those sensor heads off to conserve battery power. Now when you return, either from, from lunch when you manually turn the heads off, or from that phone call in which the liner automatically turns the sensor heads off, once you come back and turn the heads on, it will automatically go right back where it was, both in the adjustment screens or if it was in the, one of the static screens, you won't lose anything. You won't have to repeat a caster sweep. You won't have to start anything back over again. Just simply turn the head back on. It picks right back up where it was and you go on. Okay? So that's your basic navigation. Uh, all five keys here are also represented on the keyboard as they are on the head. Now one thing to remember that the F5 key on the keyboard is your gray center key. So that F5 key right there is the same as that gray center key there on the head. So when you're navigating either in the program here at the machine and it's asking for a center key or it has the option for the center key, just hit the F5, okay? So let's go right here and as a reminder, uh, as a little uh, quick refresher, I wanna talk about the wheel clamps again. I know we covered this previously in another section, but I wanna just kind of review and make sure you have a good understanding of that and that there's no questions. You remember from our previous uh, video, we had uh, basically uh, two sections to the clamp. You had the body here with all the connecting sliders for rim adjustment, uh, you, and then you had the grabber arms. The rim uh, clamp is adjusted in such a way that 
you adjust this knob to slide it out to either the outer peg position or the inner peg position. You notice we have scales on the clamp for both, outer peg and inner peg. Also remember that we have a, a bit of an overlap between the outer and inner pegs. Uh, the inner peg goes from 13 inch on out to about 20 inches. The outer peg goes from about 17 inches out to 24 lipped. Remember, very, very important, a 24 inch lip tire, no problem. If it's a 24 inch lipless tire, then that outside edge or outside dimension on that rim may actually be quite a bit more than 24 inches. So, but we do have workarounds for that. Uh, but you'll notice here that from 17 to 20, I have this on each scale. So that gives me quite a bit of flexibility depending on how bulging that sidewall is and the dimensions uh, of the tire where spokes are and that kind of thing as to use either the outside peg or the inside peg. Remember also we discussed that it's very important when you're setting the clamp up to make sure that you put all of your adapters, be it the conical, the lipless, or the dually pins, make sure you have each on the same peg. If you're using the inside uh, peg as a reference for your wheel size, make sure you have all your adapters on the inside peg. Because as you can see, there's quite a bit of difference in the positioning of these pegs from inside to outside. If you get a couple on the outside and then one on the inside, that's going to cause you quite a bit of camber error if you happen to position that on the top. If you have two, if you have one on the outside here, one on the outside there, and then one on the inside here, you can see that that would cause you quite a bit of toe out on that particular wheel, depending on if you're mounting it on the front or the back. So just be very careful about putting the position of the pins in the correct place, and you're good to go. Also remember to make sure that when you're adjusting your uh, your grabber arms here, that you actually place your grabber arm so that the divot that's drilled into the square shaft of the grabber arm can be seen through the window here, so that when I tighten the knob up, I'm actually tightening in to the divot on the back side. If you get it positioned in such a way that you're not on a divot, you're halfway through, then your grabber arm can slip and it can possibly come off of the, off the vehicle. Okay. So that's basically our setup of the grabber arm. Remember, we have three different types of adapters. We have the conical adapters, and remember, starting with the WS series aligners, these are about a quarter inch so or so longer than the BTH aligners. Uh, if you want to use the longer adapters, then you'll need to make sure you swap all 12 of them out. You can't mix and match them. Uh, they simply slide over whichever peg you have chosen, and they snap in with the little O-rings there. So you have three of those for each clamp. You also have what we call the protruding hub adapters. These would be used on like a diesel pickup or a four-wheel drive pickup that has a hub that's going to come out from the wheel, say it's sticking way out here, and it would interfere with your clamp rim pegs touching the rim before uh, that center piece would hit the, hit the uh, clamp. So you would position these over either the inside or outside and then select whichever one of your conical cones or your lipless adapter you're going to use to uh, uh, attach the wheel clamp. Okay? So that's your protruding hub for your dualies and four-wheel drives. I'm just going to lay these right over here. You already know about the conical cones. These are the ones that you will use primarily on a, on a tire that has a wheel weight position on the rim. It has a lip. So we'll just use the conical cones the reference right there on the bead of the wheel. That's the most accurate place to put it is right there on that bead. So that's where we'll use these. But before I do that, I want to uh, demonstrate the lipless adapters. The lipless adapters are the ones that have a little tang on the outside edge of the adapter. And the tire that I have here for demonstration is a 19 inch Corvette wheel. So I'm gonna set my clamp up for 19 inches. I'm gonna go ahead and use my outer pegs so I'm going to put my lipless adapter on my outer peg, position it in such a way that it's going to correspond with the arch of the wheel. And you don't have to worry about it being perfect at this point because we'll adjust it a little bit when we lay it up there. So I've got my lipless adapters positioned on the outside peg of all three of my pegs. 
I have a 19 inch wheel, so I'm going to look at my outer peg and I'm going to slide it down until the knob is at approximately 19 inches. Don't worry about getting any kind of slide rule out and getting perfect between the one and the nine. It doesn't matter. It's just you give a pretty close idea for a reference point for the rim. Don't have to snug them up real tight. Just just uh, just uh, put them down so they're not going to slip. Now, once you get that done, you're going to just lay your clamp up here for the first wheel. The first wheel is where I'm going to need to find out approximately how far out do I need to put my grabber arm. Remember in the other video, we talked about having at least a couple of fingers here at the end. About an inch or so. That'll give you enough room so you can get in there and get a good bite on it, but not so tight as to keep you from being able to take it off uh, when you get ready to remove the clamp. And as you can see here, I'm going to line it up so that my divot's in the window, and then just run that, that knob down. Don't have to go real crazy tight, just snug it down. I've got five notches showing, five divots showing on the outside here. So I'll go ahead and set this other side up so that I have five showing on it also. That gives me five. And I can see my divot in the window. So now I want to look and make sure that I have all of my uh, uh, little tangs positioned so that they're going to go on the outside portion of this lipless wheel. I'm going to go between the uh, rim itself and the uh, curb protector rubber that's part of the tire, I'm going to bite right in between those. So I'll edge this one up a little bit so that it clears. And when I have it up there where it clears, I'm just going to push in an equal amount of pressure with both grabber arms, and that's it. And now you can see, you can get a close-up of that. The important thing to remember on these lipless adapters, especially when dealing with uh, low profile tires with rim protection, make sure that when you have it installed that you have the tang right in between the, the rim and that you have the flat spot or shoulder of this lipless adapter resting on the rim. All three of them must be on the rim. One can't be caught this way, that way, top or bottom, or that will give you a false positive camber or give you a false toe rating. So all three of them's got to be flat against the rim, and it is. Also be careful on aftermarket tires uh, that you uh, actually get this on, a, on a, a, a common point of reference. I don't have to worry about this Corvette wheel so much because it is even right here all the way around, but if it was a wheel that, for example, this spoke was bowed up, it was raised high off this edge, and then these were recessed a little bit. Well, even though I get all three flat against the rim, I still got this one pulled way out on the spoke and these two down in a divot. So my reading's gonna be inaccurate. Always position it so that you get three common points of reference. If you can't get three uh, common points of reference, regardless of how you position the clamp, put it on there as best you can and perform your run-out compensation. And it will compensate uh, for the rim position. Okay? All right, so that's our lipless. I'm going to take this uh, clamp off and position it so that we can get started on our line. Now, of course this demonstration is going to take us a little bit longer than three minutes, but once you get started and get accustomed to setting the machine up, then uh, it will take you about three minutes, uh, maybe a little less on some cars, maybe a little bit more on others, uh, to get this thing positioned up. Uh, about three minutes or so, and you should have uh, be at your adjustment screen or at the summary screen uh, at the least. All right, this is a 13, 14 inch wheel, so I'm going to set it on 14 on the bottom. I'm going to use the uh, inner pegs, I'm going to use my conical pegs. I'll set it right there into where the wheel weight goes. I'll drop this one down until it is resting on the shoulder of where the uh, wheel weight goes on top. I'm going to adjust these in until I have it about an inch or so away, which looks about like three showing. Just this one, so I've got three showing. And once I get this first clamp set up, I can go ahead and set my grabber arms up on all the other three clamps before I ever put it up here on the tire. I don't want to have to be sitting there holding it while I'm adjusting it. 
I can adjust it to three, set my grab arms, uh, my rim pegs in the correct position, bring it up here. The only thing I have to adjust once I get the wheel up there, is I just have to adjust this up uh, until I get it where I want it to, on the wheel weight resting position. Okay, so that's got that. Push my grab arms in, pull my pins, install my front head. This you can see is the front head on the 1760. Uh, it contains a battery in this back compartment here, which the battery, cleverly enough, is used for counterbalance. So that's how they balance the head so it hangs a level. And it has the boom with the extra camera in it. So as you saw uh, previously, the rear head only has a single camera in the rear. Right here. No boom, just a single camera in the rear. So I'll turn it on by hitting the center key. Turn this one also. Now, one thing a lot of you will notice is that the rear heads do not have a level bottom. And you're going, that's going to be uncomfortable for you, but worry not because the rear heads don't require a level bottom because the rear plate on this head, where our camera, CCD camera mounts, and our inclinometers, which are solid state mount, is machined and uh, the components are mounted in such a way that they're always perfectly per perpendicular uh, with my stub shaft. A lot of manufacturers have an assembly and it's pretty accurate. They bolt their components to it, which they may or may not bolt the same way all the time. Sometimes temperature affects them, one thing or another, so they have to be compensated. For that reason, they're only accurate at that level position. That's the only place in which they've been compensated to be accurate. Because if they're not mounted perfectly perpendicular to the shaft as they rotate, rather than their inclinometers swinging perfectly front to back, they're going to swing at a little bit of a cant. And if that's the case, depending on where you put your head, maybe the camera will read a little negative, maybe it'll read a little bit positive, so they have to be positioned perfectly level in accordance to a level bottle or an indicator on the screen in order for that uh, uh, reading to be accurate. It has to be at that particular position. Well, since we mount our sensor head components in such a way that they're always perfectly perpendicular to my uh, stub shaft, it doesn't matter if I have a level bottle or not. They just can't be pointed to the ceiling. They can't be pointed to the floor. They've got to be kind of pointed to the front. You got that? You got it made. I go around and turn the other heads on. Okay. Now once I get all my sensor heads on, as the liner uh, recognizes the head, you'll notice that your Bluetooth icons will go from gray to blue. Once you see blue on your Bluetooth icons, the heads are talking to the machine. They've been recognized. They're ready to go. Now, for this demonstration purpose, the first few screens I'm going to walk through using the keypad. But understand that you can also do the same navigation for any other sensor head. So I could be standing here uh, at the passenger side and I can hit my green key and I can advance forward in the alignment program. Okay? I can hit the red key and go back to the main screen. But just so that I can use my finger to point things out, I'm going to step up here and uh, show you how to navigate through it. So from this screen, if I'm ready to do the alignment, I'm ready to begin, I'm going to hit the green, uh, green key, which is the F4 key here. It's going to take me to a screen in which I can select my target data. Now, most of the times, the machines will come pre-set up with the USA-only target data, but don't... Uh, Worry, every spec available through RAV worldwide is already on your machine. If you do a lot of OEM repairs, if you're a body shop that the insurance company is requiring you to provide the OEM specs for the repair, uh, if you're a high-end shop that you only work on Ferraris, BMWs, Mercedes, well, we can go in there and customize that spec for you, or you can either one. It's very simple to do so that only, uh, the only vehicles that are displayed are those that you choose. So you can have a list of vehicles that would take you a week to sort through, or you can narrow it down to just the vehicles that you're interested in, or you can just keep a, a particular market, like USA, there so that when you need something, it'll be there. 
So if I had other selections here, for example, if I had USA and then I had OEM, well then I would have an OEM selection here too, and I can scroll up using the blue key or down uh, using the yellow key. So USA is where I want to go. Uh, green forward would be the F4 key. Okay. Now here I can page up or page down to kind of sort through these selections. Um, we're just going to pick out something. Uh, I'm going to say that this dude is a Lamborghini. Obviously, this is a Fiat, but we're going to call it a Lamborghini. If I wanted to look for something, say for example, a Ford, and I could hit the F key, you'll notice that it'll populate a little F right there. F, and it's going to take me to my first S, which in this case is Ferrari. And we could be driving Ferrari. Uh, if I want to scan for something else, I hit the backspace to remove that selection. It goes to the very beginning of your database, uh, and then I can select something else. So I'm feeling like Ferrari today. So I select Ferrari, it's in green. I bring an arrow forward to get over here to this selection. If it was a 208, I would just bring an arrow forward and select the 208. Now you see how I have uh, three uh, greater than signs uh, in this uh, selection. That means that there's multiple vehicles to choose from. If this particular model will only pertain to a certain year model range, well, it's going to give you that year model range uh, there to the right of the selection. So I'm going to go ahead and select Ferrari 308. And thank you, FedEx, very much. Hit it and hit my green air forward. And now you see I have a GTBI and a GTSI from 1975 to 1991, uh, same, same selection error. So that's the one I'm going to call it. I'm going to go green arrow forward. And here are our specs. This is basically a spec sheet so that you can look at it and observe any factory uh, specified conditions that must, that must be met, such as vehicle loading. You know, a lot of Europeans, they want 80 kilograms here, 200 kilograms there, whatever. So this will tell you real quickly where to load the vehicle if required. Most domestics, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, fuel level, if the manufacturer specifies a particular amount of fuel in the gas tank, or there's a different spec for different amounts of fuel, this is where you'd see it here. And for us domestic guys, Mazda is really about the only ones that wear us out. Domestically sold vehicles, I should say. So, also below that, if you have a different track width and wheelbase, uh, the manufacturers will give you that so you can compare it to what you have. And uh, wheel size. So, if the car came out with a 14-inch wheel and now it's got 17s on it, you see I have a selection here with my uh, yellow key. I can select the yellow key, and now I can go up or down using my blue or yellow keys on the keyboard. F2 for blue. F3 for yellow, and I can tell it that I've got a different size rim on there. I've got some 16s. Okay? So I'm going to change that back to 14 because, believe it or not, that's actually what we have. And you can also go through here and look at each of the uh, uh, specifications to see what you got. Uh, and so that you've got a good game plan together. Uh, a lot of times they like for you to look at these specs, especially in a dealership environment, OEM type environment, so that uh, if it is a pretty late production car, and perhaps there have been a few uh, TSPs or technical service bulletins released on the car concerning alignment angles, you can make sure that the alignment angles that you're using are, are correct and current to the manufacturer. If they're not, you can simply go in there and, and change them by hitting the insert key, and then it will prompt you to go through each line, and you can put your own uh, spec in. Now, that does not replace the OEM spec or the spec that comes with your update. It adds to it. And in that list, you'll notice that if you add a spec, that it will show up in black while all the others are blue. Some models, they're all black, and your user is inserted as blue. But whichever, it'll be a different color. That's how you can notate that it is a user added spec. So this is the one we're going to go with. I'm just going to go forward. It, this screen is telling you to, uh, and I taught this along my head's turned off. Let me turn it on a little bit. Okay. 
Now, as soon as I get back to blue right here, all right, my right front picked up. You'll notice that it'll give you a battery charge indication on the top of the screen. It's telling you to install the heads here. And it's also, before you start the alignment, you're getting some indication as to what your battery charge level is. The second part of the screen here is just telling you to raise the vehicle up and uh, pin your plates. You can do, from this screen, you can do additional measurements and diagnostics of the vehicle as far as tow, test for towing curve, looking at offset, vehicle wheel offsets, and any kind of collision damage. You can go to this screen. Are you sure? Yes. Just grab a hand asking me for a level. For a perfect straight ahead here. Okay. This screen, this is where we're actually only using two heads. So if you want to do just a quick alignment check, you'll notice that I'm doing it with only the front two heads. Rear heads are completely out of the picture. This is just a little quick diagnostic screen that you can actually do on the service drive, or if you just want to bring one in real quick that's had a little bit of collision damage, or if you want to bring one in uh, and you're running a promotion, say a pre alignment check with brake inspection, whatever the deal is, well, rather than having to go through the whole uh, process of putting all four clamps on, all four heads on, doing all that, you can simply just stick the front clamps on the front heads real quick and you get your camber and tow, your wear angles, all the cause tire wear. Real quick, bam, get it on there and you're down the road. Okay. So this will take me back home, this will take me back. Great key. And back again. Okay, slide the rear heads back on. Start our four wheel alignment. Our green arrow forward at this point. This is the run out compensation screen. Now, the clamps that, are, that we are using here are non run out clamps. So it's not necessary to perform the run out compensation unless, as we discussed before, you're having to mount in such a way that you can't get three common points of contact or you have a rim that's so badly damaged on the face of the rim where you're putting the clamp that you can't get around the damage, or if you know that the rim is bent, obviously bent, and you want to perform a run-out compensation. Now, you can do it on just the one wheel. You know, I've, I've discovered over the years it really depends on how you were raised, what you cut your teeth on as far as alignment equipment goes. A lot of people are going to do it on the front wheels no matter what. That's fine. If that's the way that makes you feel most comfortable. But uh, time and time again, study after study after study, we found that this type of clamp, when properly installed, puts no negligible amount of run out into the alignment angles. You can put it on there, you can put it on there properly, and uh, you can put it on an undamaged wheel, then uh, you're not going to have any run out issues. So. But uh, this is the place where you would do it. If you needed to do run out for whatever reason, I'm just going to demonstrate it on one wheel and it'll be simulated. I can't jack this one up. So you go to whichever wheel you want to perform your run out measurement. In this case, I'm going to go right over here to the front. You 
see that it's instructing you to press the center key. You notice the key goes on, the key goes off on the screen there. So I'll press the center key. Now the screen is instructing us to turn the wheel 180 degrees. So with the wheel raised up, I would move this position of the clamp and rotate the wheel into this, this particular post of the clamp was pointing straight down. Naturally, I'd have to loosen off of the stub shaft so that the clamp could spin. Okay, the head could spin in the clamp. Once I get it positioned uh, down, I would hit the center key again. It's telling me to stop. And now it's telling me to rotate the clamp back to the original 12 o'clock position. So it's a two point run out. It's going to take a picture here, it's going to take a picture down there, it's going to take another picture when it comes back. And it's going to average those readings and come out with a run out number. That's it. That's, just, that's all there is to run out. You can do it on one wheel, or you can do it on the front, or you can do all four, whatever makes you happy. Now from this screen forward, I am going to go ahead and just use the keypads on the heads here to do my navigation. So from this point, I'm, I'm finished with this, uh, with this part of the program. I'm going to green arrow forward. Now it's instructing me to lower the vehicle back down, uh, remove the turn plate pins, install the brake pedal depressor. Very important that you get the brake pedal depressor put in. If you have a, uh, which most cars are now, uh, power brakes, make sure you got the vehicle running when you install that brake pedal depressor. If you have an older uh, SUV or some older pickups, uh, especially with floating uh, calipers on them, a lot of times those will be pretty sticky. And without the power brake assist, you won't get those front wheels locked down. And uh, if you're turning, making your caster sweep at the wheel, you'll actually rotate the tire slightly as you're struggling trying to turn that tire, and you'll throw the caster reading off. So for that reason, make sure the vehicle's running, and use that power brake assist to apply that part that uh, brake pedal pressure. Once you get all that done, we're going to settle the car down front and back. That settles that suspension back down just in case. Uh, you have raised it up, uh, then you're ready to go forward. So we'll hit the green key. It's prompting me for straight ahead. You notice how the arrow, curved arrow to the right of the steering wheel is telling you to turn to the left. So I'm going to turn it just a little bit to the left. Now level my head. I'm going to level this as I took it off. Again, we don't have to level the rear because of the way that they're designed. The inclination is constantly changed on the front, so we level those as a reference point for our caster sleeve. That's the only reason we level these fronts is the reference point. All right now we're getting our uh, indication for our turning routine, tow out on turns. And you'll notice that on the blue key on your screen, it's labeled 10 degrees. So we're currently in the mode to do a 10 degree caster sweep. If for whatever reason you wanted to change that to a 20 degree caster sweep, you just hit the uh, button, uh, the yellow button, cycle it through until you get to 20 degrees. If you're at the uh, race car shop or you have someone's uh, dirt track car in that uh, they're interested in their ankleman, era, uh, ankleman angle also, well then we can perform this and uh, you'll notice that it'll prompt you twice for each turn left, for each turn right, and it will calculate uh, what that uh, Ackerman angle is. But for our uh, purposes here, we're gonna stick with the 10 degree. But that's a very handy function. There's nothing in the software you gotta go in and change. You simply make a key selection from the wheel while you're doing it. So now I'm going to do my sweep to the left. Now the little triangle equals that you see there is an indication of your toe out on turns. So you can kind of do a little bit of diagnosis while you're doing your turn. Looks like I got a half a degree toe out on turn turning to the left. Tenths or so, if you caught it there as I was turning to the right, so it's pretty close. If, if all of your steering arms are equal, and 
there has been no damage, then your toilet on turns should be about the same on both sides. The exception of that is some European cars, especially on your multi-link suspensions, uh, many of those will have a different toe out left and right. Okay? So now I am at what we'll call the summary screen. Uh, this is our rear camber, you can see at the top. Uh, our rear toe and our thrust angle. That's our two uh, wear angles on the rear and the uh, thrust angle is what's going to cause us to have drivability problems or crooked steering wheels. Uh, you notice on our blue key now, our blue key uh, is a selection so that we can change from large numbers in a small graphic that we currently see. If I hit the blue key, it'll change to a large graphic in little numbers. It's strictly a preference. One is just as accurate as the other. It shows exactly the same information, just in two different formats. So here you have a graphic in the middle telling you what's camber, what's toe, and then thrust angle is known. If you'll notice as a point of reference, you'll see from this angle I'm looking uh, kind of straight ahead at the vehicle as if I were looking at it from ground level. This is a bird's eye view or looking down at the wheels since I have the drive shaft moving to the front of the vehicle. So I know that I'm looking bird's eye down at it. This is going to be my toe. This is looking at it from the side, positive and negative for my camber. So I know this is my camber. Again, I can just hit the, uh, the blue key and cycle it back and forth between the two numbers. Okay? This is not a live screen. You see these are fixed. They're not changing. I could go back here and Move this, uh, move this wheel around a little bit, move the clamp around a little bit, numbers don't change. They're fixed. Because this is a summary screen. The purpose of this screen is just so you get your head together and decide what routine, what you need to do, what's the most important thing, prioritize things. Okay? So from this screen, I'll go ahead and hit my green key. I've got four remotes. It's cool. I can do it from anywhere. This is the summary screen for the front. I have caster, I have front camber, and I have individual toes. They're all in green, all in red here because they're all out of spec. Here's my spec, four degrees. It can be as low as three and a half, it can be as high as four and a half. The values you see both on the display screens for your spec as well as in the spec selection are the actual values. Uh, some of you may be used to using Bosch, Bosch Bar, uh, some of the other machines that give you a range, and then you have to do the math. They'll say it's uh, 2 degrees plus or, plus or minus 1.75. you got to add and you got to subtract. Well, this machine, you know, there's no math for you to do. Not that you couldn't. It just prevents mistakes, and it shows you what the actual number is. So down here for negative 0.17, positive 0.17 with a zero as my preferred, that means I could be as low, uh, as much uh, negative camber as negative 0.17 or as much camber as positive 17 being my spec okay, for the vehicle that I have selected. Okay. Same thing for partial tow. These are what we would call individual tows. Alright, right, now if you see immediately that this collision repaired vehicle, there's not a hope of doing alignment on it because you don't have enough eccentric, you don't have enough shims, and you wouldn't want to do it anyway. And I can simply print it or save it from the yellow key. Take it off the machine, leave it with the customer, send it back to the body shop, whatever the case may be. If I decide that I want to go ahead and get the alignment done, then I can simply green air forward from any one of my heads. Are you sure? And then the green key is yes. Now it's saying you go in there and center that steering wheel. So this thing is grossly uh, off position here. So I'm going to center my steering wheel. Lock it down. Okay. And then from here, I can just bring it before I can tell the machine I've got it locked down. Okay. Now you notice I have wrenches beside all of my uh, readings, all my display. I have a wrench. This tells me that I'm at the adjustment screen. Okay? If you see a wrench beside a box, you're at an adjustment screen. If you don't see the wrench, you're at a summary or a print screen, and it's a fixed value. Now you see on the rear, that when I go back here to make adjustments, 
But I'm actually going to be moving numbers. you want to do your camber first, then your toe. This will take care of itself, the thrust angle, as we correct these toe values. Okay. So let's see how close I can get this fiat here. I think my top spec is a negative 25. So one, two, five. There it goes in the green. I hope you never had to do one quite this bad. Okay. And now for my toe, it looks like uh, the spec for my toe is a positive 25 partial toe, so I will adjust my partial toe. Okay. And you notice that as I adjust the partial toe, the rear that I got Thrust thing all accurate in the spec. Okay? I'm done with the rear. Let's advance on to the front. Now something else you'll notice about this screen is on the center key. I don't know how well you can see that, but on the center key, we have a symbol of a vehicle, picture of a car, looks like a Dodge Charger to me. It also has a little red arrow pointing up right above that. This is our jack and hold screen. So you can actually jack the entire vehicle up and uh, do all your adjustments with the uh, wheels dangling in the air. You can do caster, camber, and tug. And much like some of the other uh, aligners uh, that are not terribly accurate, this machine in jack and hold is extremely accurate. Uh, I've done alignments personally with this machine and changed caster values a little over two degrees and re-strip it once I got it back down to flakes and it would, it would be within a tenth or so. I mean, it would be real accurate. A lot of liners I've used in the past, if you're more than a half degree or so more in actual change, uh, better re-sweep because once you put it down, it may overshoot one way or it may under undershoot, you never can tell. It's on the suspension John. So we'll go ahead and advance to the front. And you notice that the uh, uh, let, me, let me turn this here just a little bit here. You notice that on our top here, it's frozen and has hash marks in it. Uh, the way the product will come, it'll come automatically set up for a frozen caster reading. 90% of the time, you're not going to be doing a caster uh, adjustment on the car anyway. But when you do need to do it, uh, you, can, you can navigate using the center key. You notice that the center key now is a R with up and down arrow. That just means to relocate. We're going to relocate uh, this position here. So I hit my F5 key, which is my center key. I'm going to move it up here to caster. Okay. Then I can use shift F5. Hold down the shift key, hit the F5 key, and that will unlock your caster readings. Okay. The reason that can be handy to, unlock, to lock those caster readings is, say, for example, we're back on the insurance part. If you're doing alignment on it. Everything's good. Maybe the caster is a tenth or a few hundredths from being out of the spec. And both sides are real close to each other. They may be three or four tenths apart, which is fine. They're split the right direction so the vehicle's not going to pull. It's going to drive nice. You know, based on your experience and everything, this is not an issue. But you also know that if anything on that printout goes in the red, the insurance company is going to kick it back on you. So, 
You need to make a little bit of a, a camera adjustment here, or maybe you need to make a little bit of a toe adjustment down here. So, in order to keep that from going into the red, even though it's not an issue, now this is not something that's designed to cover up shoddy work, even though it's not an issue, uh, it may turn red and cause this thing to be unacceptable to the insurance company. I can freeze that good value so that when I get to the printout menu, it will still be in green, even though it may have moved just slightly. But in this case, I do want to adjust it, so I'm going to do Shift F5, and now I have the uh, all three of my angles, caster, camber, and individual toe, that I can start adjusting them. Okay, so let's start off, let's say, with, uh, let's do our caster first. Our caster is four degrees. Uh, it can be as low as three and a half, it can be as high as four and a half, and, uh, and still be within spec. So it's extremely low on both sides. Something I want you to notice, that when I walk in front of these cameras on the front, I've got the beams completely blocked but I'm still getting readings. Once the machine takes that initial reading and it takes that snapshot of those front toes, it knows where all the wheels are at this point. It knows the relationship in toe, camera, and caster. And since it's taken that initial uh, photograph, that picture, when we had the wheels in a straight ahead level position, it knows that any individual change on any one of the wheels based on the track toe, the toe camera is going down the side, it knows what corresponding change in total toe that's going to make on the front of the vehicle. So for practical purposes, we can turn that bit off. I mean, we can walk right in the middle of it and do our adjustments. So that's what I'm going to do. I'll start over here on this side and start with my caster adjustment. You want to get it up within spec, say, four and four. I'm going to make a camera adjustment now. It's supposed to be zero. I'm going to bring it out to about zero. I'm going to step over here on this caster adjustment. And I'm going to bring it up. Now, this is going to be a huge caster adjustment. Okay? It's going to be four degrees. So, let's see how close it is when we do our sweep. I doubt you'll ever do a four degree unless you've replaced something. my camera adjustment. Okay. And now I'm going to do my toe. something I want to show you on these heads while I'm making these adjustments here. And that you notice, if you'll pan down to this head over here, I can use the center key on the head to change representation or, re or relocate my red R so that it is now on the toe screen. See right here, I've got a red R at the toe. When I do that, I tell the machine also not only am I relocating it to do uh, freezing functions, but I'm also relocating it to control the LEDs on these heads. The front heads have LEDs, three on each head, to indicate whether it's towed out too much or towed in too much. And both of my LEDs are currently, the front LEDs are lit because I'm towed out too much. I'm, I'm sorry, towed, towed in too much on this one. Okay. So I can move it. And as I move it, I can 
as I get closer uh, to my value, you'll notice the LEDs start to reflect. Correct adjust. Go one way too far, or if I get it dead perfect, it'll shine and it'll flash only the green on purple. And I can just simply cycle through uh, each one of the uh, screens that they're using the R to change my LEDs to uh, represent caster, camber, or tote. That can be real handy on some uh, Asian imports. Uh, uh, any of the vehicles that have eccentrics on the rear control arms that you have to get underneath the vehicle and sit there and move in the eccentric, it's not real handy if you can't see the screen or if you don't have a remote. You can simply look at your LEDs and tell when you're within spectrum line. Okay? Alright, so I need to adjust this back down a little bit. Okay, so that tells you what your LEDs do. A real handy function and you can simply cycle around on the head using the grade key. Now my LEDs indicate my caster. Now my LEDs indicate my, my camber and then back to tow. So that's a real handy function, especially if you can't see the uh, uh, screen again, if you have like an Asian car or import that has uh, eccentric bolts and lower control arms where it's not real handy to see the screen, but you can see the uh, displays on the heads. It makes it much easier. Now let's go back and uh, uh, re-sweep our caster. You'll see I have a steer uh, an image of a steering wheel, a little icon, showing a steering wheel being turned. So. I'm going to use the red key, and it's prompting me to do my sweep. I'm going to come up here and unlock my steering wheel, and do my sweep to the left. And again, it's showing my toe out on turns underneath the triangle, or beside the triangle, uh, as I turn the wheel. The left, now I just want me to turn to the right. I was 340 to the left. It looks like I'm going to be about 341 to the right. So they're the same. Nothing bent on my little Fiat Ferrari here. Kind of get back straight again. In. Close. All right. I had to center my steering wheel again. And my tail, amazingly enough, stayed you know, it's pretty close to where I had it. Steering wheel back the same place. My little Ferrari here is not cooperating. Okay, so you notice, look at my caster numbers. Remember that I started off at some ridiculously low number on the driver's side and I made a four degree change. It was like 4.08 or something like that. It's within a tenth of where the machine said it would, had moved it to. And it doesn't matter if you're in raised vehicle mode or if you did it down the turn place like I just did. It's just as accurate. The machine is very accurate on these caster changes and whatever it says on the screen, unless you're making something really huge, but brother, that's what it's going to be when you put it back down. So at this point, I'll green air forward. And from this screen, it's showing me my before diagnostic screen on the left. Uh, what the numbers represent there in the center, and then what the final adjustment readings wound up being at that point. Now from here, I can hit my red key, go back and wrench on the car some more. I go back to my adjustments. I can hit my blue key, and if I got this far down the road and I said, oh man, I got the wrong spec, I got the wrong car. This is not a Ferrari, it's a Fiat. I can go right there and re-change or reselect the vehicle, and it will repopulate these, these numbers as far as green and red. Uh, I can print it and save it, uh, or I can uh, go forward and start a new alignment. So if I do the yellow key here, uh, right here is where I'll come up here and I will give it a little bit of customer information. This is customer test, uh, and the license number is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's really all I need to do. I've got two asterisks. Those are really the only two things that are required to save the document. 
You can also put the VIN, the miles, or make any kind of a notation here as far as the customer declined to repair or return to the body shop, whatever the case may be. If you want to print it, just hit the yellow key there, uh, and then it will prompt for the print. It will show the print out here on the screen again. It shows which axle we're talking about, front or back. It gives a description of the angles. It gives the target values, which is your spec. It gives the diagnostic or the before adjustment readings, and then the after adjustment readings here. And we can select this to be in green or in black, in bold or in plain. It's completely up to you how you have that set up. From here, I can change it. I hit the uh, key down here, the green key. Now it's going to populate everything in just plain red and plain black, so nothing's in red. Change it back. Does it need a green? You see they're in a red or black. Uh, now I can uh, print it. I hit the uh, yellow key here. Sends the document to the printer. And we're good to go. From here on out, I just hit the red key to cycle back out. And once I do that, just hit the green key again to start a new alignment. I hope this is informative to you. The uh, next aligner we do will be the 2200, and that will be followed by the truck system.